So, I mean, either extraterrestrials are coming here and, and making this stuff and doing it, and, it, and there's something going on there like that, or else ancient humans, uh, Atlanteans, we, have, you know, we eventually took off into space 100,000 years ago, and we did all this stuff. So if everyone will come back in, we have another really wonderful presentation to begin. Our next presenter is David Hatcher Childress, the voice of ancient aliens, one of the most prolific researchers, and as I said yesterday, uh, the one I consider to be the true living Indiana Jones. And uh, he is going to talk today about stone balls, obelisk, uh, Tesla, the moon, and Mars. David Hatcher Childress. Thank you, and so thanks very much. So I uh, hopefully most of you were here yesterday, and uh, just once again I want to say it's been great being here, and uh, these conferences are always pretty exciting, and I I learn a lot too. We're going to start with giant stone balls, and then uh, we're going to talk about one of my favorite topics, uh, obelisks and Tesla, and then we'll head for the moon and Mars. So fasten your seatbelts, and let's, let's try and dim the lights a bit, if possible. So traveling all over the world, and my own interest in, in megaliths, and the purpose of megaliths, uh, the moving and, and the, the carving of, of megaliths. Um, this has led me on a, a number of journeys. And at one time, some years ago, I went on a trip to Costa Rica. And one of the things that Costa Rica is famous for are these megalithic granite stone balls. Archaeologists don't know what they're about, what they're for. Uh, they're, they're made out of granite. They're, they're, in most cases, perfectly spherical. In Costa Rica today, if you go to San Jose, you'll, you'll see them at the museum there. They're also in uh, uh, sort of um, green areas in front of banks and, and some of the uh, sort of governmental buildings and stuff there. Some of them are, are very big. Um, nearly the size of a car. Others are, are somewhat smaller. And it's particularly with these, these large balls. They, archaeologists just have no idea why they would be making these stone balls. And they're difficult to make. Having to, uh, to cut and, and just create a perfect sphere out of stone is very difficult to do by hand. And once again, uh, archaeologists are saying, yeah, they're just bashing out these stone balls with a stone hammer in their hand. And to do that and create a perfect sphere is, is almost impossible. So it's, all, it's sort of like uh, the stone balls are, 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 again, made by like a CAD program. And that's how if, if today we were going to try and create stone balls, like to be, to be in front of a Target store or something. And <laughs> Target stores do have stone balls in front of them. Uh, thousands of years from now, they'll be baffling archaeologists, I know. <laughs> Most of the ball stone balls in Costa Rica come from just the very uh, southwest part of Costa Rica, right near Panama. And there's an island, too, that's just off Costa Rica, and it also has these stone balls. They're mainly just found in the jungle. And uh, the, the archaeologists would... Uh, it's like they've got washed up in some tidal wave into these jungle hills of southwest uh, Costa Rica. Some of the smaller balls have been found in certain uh, burial sites. And so, therefore, archaeologists came up with the idea that, oh, uh, that, the, that the stone balls of Costa Rica were, you know, ceremonial important objects and the chiefs all got a stone ball, and, and then they would bury one with them. And yet there's still no explanation, you know, why they're doing this. It, and it, again, like with so many megalithic uh, structures, it's a lot of effort, apparently, to make these stone balls. So now, interestingly, uh, a guy sent to me from Santa Monica this, uh, this little book about the, the trolley. And in 1908, 
in Los Angeles. They, they were making this electric trolley that went through Santa Monica. And this was a booklet about it. And so because electric trolleys can only go up a, a, a very kind of small uh, grade, and it, it, they can't go over big hills and stuff, they brought in these steam shovels into Santa Monica to get rid of some of the hills that were in Santa Monica that's, uh, uh, so that the track could be level. So it was this steam shovel in Santa Monica then was taking out this, this hill. There were all these stone balls in there. And at the time, the, the archaeologists and historians said, oh, yeah, a bunch of dinosaur eggs. <laughs> They've all disappeared, these balls. We don't know what happened to them. They ended up in probably gardens and things like that in, in Los Angeles. And then, now get this, if you go up to Franz Josef Land, in the, which is in the Russian Antarctic, which is near Spitsbergen, up there are also these stone balls. And they're granite, some of them are broken, others apparently are like perfectly spherical. In this case, archaeologists and geologists are probably going to say these are somehow natural. And some stone balls are natural, apparently, but some stone balls are absolutely, no question about it, artificial, uh, like the ones in Costa Rica. Uh, the ones in San Franz Joseph land, we don't, it would seem that they are also artificial, but what they're doing there. Is, is a, a huge question. Uh, and, and again, we don't, don't know why anybody would make these stone balls anyway. They're pretty uh, perfect. Uh, the, the natural explanation would be some kind of uh, the, the volcanic bombs that are shot out, and then in the air they become spherical, and then they land and cool, and you've got, got yourself a natural stone ball. That's, that's their sort of reaching for an explanation, shall we say, although there's a place in Mexico where maybe this did happen. Uh, on one of the trips to Bosnia that I made, um, we were taken to a, to a site out in uh, sort of north central Bosnia, and there there were all these stone balls also in this uh, kind of river bed that was dry. And we spent the day looking at all these stone balls, and they were they were curious. Here they are. I mean, some of them are kind of broken and stuff, but but others are really like perfect stone balls. So what is the point of them? Why? In Mexico is this place called Piedras Bola, uh, stone balls. It too has stone balls there. Uh, the geologists are going to say, yeah, these again are these, they're natural. There's some kind of volcanic bombs that have been spewed out of some volcano. Uh, but perhaps that is the case here. Again, we, we just don't know what's going on with stone balls. But stone balls are also found in various places in Italy like this place, San Augusta in, in Italy. Sometimes you'll see them. Uh, this is also in Italy. Uh, they're, you know, they're, they, people find them, and then they kind of they roll them up to, you know, in front of a castle or some chateau or something like that. So these are all some stone balls in Italy. More stone balls in Italy. I, these aren't, these are not cannonballs or something. They're just, they're stone balls, and they're ancient. Uh, what they were for, why this is, um, uh, let's see, um, this is in, in Croatia, here we are, Dubrovnik, and there too, they had all these stone balls. Some of them maybe have, perhaps have been used in like a catapults or something like that, they were all stacked up. None of them are as large as the big stone balls in, in Costa Rica and stuff. There's this place here in uh, Hunan, China, called Gongxi, and it's this town, and it's famous for having all these stone balls in it. And it, it's the, the big tourist attraction there in, in Gongxi. Here's one of the stone balls. So these stone balls are all over the world. And in, in fact, in remote places like Franz Joseph Land, where nobody really lives. These, this is Malta, and uh, there are stone balls there. Archaeologists have uh, theorized that some of the stone balls, like the ones at Malta, were somehow used in moving the megaliths. So you've got some giant slab of, of granite or limestone or something, and then you, you put some stone balls underneath it, and you kind of, you know, roll it down the road or something. Or the stone balls in, in uh, Malta. They're smaller ones. And now, this is a stone ball in the museum on Easter Island. And it's a perfect stone ball, about the size of uh, maybe a volleyball or a little bit smaller. And in fact, when you're on Easter Island, the, the natives there tell you the most important thing on the whole island is this stone ball. 
And it's, it's not with the statues and stuff like that. It is in its own little um, kind of little corral, and it has a couple of small stone balls around it. And it's on the north side of the island. And, they, and on Easter Island, they call it the navel of the world. Cusco also calls itself the navel of the world, the center of the world. And this stone ball is, is it. This is the center of the world, this stone ball on the island. And it's not in the middle of the island. It's, it's kind of near the north coast. We'll go real quick through Easter Island. Robert Schock was showing a lot of good uh, slides of it. What's interesting to me is that I, I think that it has to do, they are cone heads. They have the long ears. He was talking about that. There's, they say on Easter Island that after they quarried the, the statues at the Ron Rocco volcano, that the statues themselves then walked around the island by themselves. And they had to walk in a clockwise way around this center volcano here. So if, a, in theory, this is what they're saying, the, the statues are walking by, the, by themselves, and they would come out here from the volcano. But if a statue was to be on this side of the island, it actually had to walk all the way around here to get to the north side to come up here, as I'm saying. They had, and there's a big vortex area here. When Jacques Cousteau was on the island doing the diving, and, and Jacques was talking about that, they had from the Calypso an ultralight plane, and they wanted to, uh, his son, Philippe, wanted to fly the ultralight up around Easter Island. And they warned him. They said, don't go near this one volcano over here. It's a vortex. And on the maps of Easter Island, it, it actually points out there's a magnetic anomaly there, some kind of vortex area. It's, it's, it's actually indicated on maps. Philippe crashed his ultralight. I mean, he went there. They told him not to, like in the Bermuda Triangle or something like that. He crashed, and he was almost killed, and they had to medevac him back to Santiago to save his life. So apparently this vortex, is, from what I could tell, somehow was part of this anti-gravity levitation that moved the, the statues through the island. Here's the lake that's in the crater, and it has the Tortora reeds, which are the same reeds that are at Lake Titicaca, and that you build to read boats. And so it would seem that on Lake, on Easter Island, they were also building and the, the reed boats that we know that they used in, in Harappa and in, in, in Egypt, in Iraq, in Lake Titicaca, and on Easter Island. Just to show you how so big some of the statues are, it's pretty interesting. It's interesting to know, too, they were, uh, Robert Schock was talking about the, the top heads. It's a red top knot. And they used a red tuff. And then one idea is it's rather not so much a hat, but their hairstyle. And the sadhus of India, these holy men who go wandering around, what they do is they grow their hair very long, and then they tie it in a big knot on the top of their head. Uh, and, that, and that's a, a hairstyle. Uh, so there's indication they were doing that too. As Robert pointed out too, this is he Thor Heyerdahl's... Uh, excavation in, in, in the 50s, and I met him in Peru in, in 1980. What, what a super guy. But yeah, people don't understand that these things are totally buried, and half of them are underground, and that kind of buildup would have taken so long, and it shows you that these statues have been sitting there, really, uh, for, I think, too, thousands of years. What these Islanders also say is that there were eyes, inlaid eyes were put in the statues, that the ones that were, were removed from the quarry, and they all faced inland around the island, and their job was to emit this power from their eyes, which they called mana, and that mana was to keep the island from sinking, because they were from a lost land called Hiva. It had sunken under the ocean, and Easter Island was just the very uh, end, a bit of that island that hadn't sunk, and so this is their claim, and m many of the books on Easter Island talk about this. So those, that's what the statue's function was, the, the ones around the island, to keep the rest of the island from sinking into the ocean. This is this unusual, it's the only statue there that it's a woman. Uh, it's basalt, as, uh, as Robert Schock was pointing out. It's a very, very unusual statue, and, and looks like some kind of conehead, alien. Uh, very, very oddball statue. This is another one, and this was excavated in 1960, but it wasn't, uh, didn't end up in the museum until uh, around the year 2000. 
and it's this oddball sort of gray alien uh, sort of looking person. And this too is, is something of a unique statue on the island. You have places like Vinapu. It, it's very fine construction. They're using power tools, again, to, to create this. And it's interesting, too, that the word Vinapu is very similar to the Sanskrit word Vimana, which means the, uh, you know, the, the airships. And in fact, right here by Vinapu, this is right at the end of the runway, the giant uh, runway airport on uh, Easter Island. And that runway is one of the few runways in the world where the space shuttle could land. And it was NASA who built that runway. They wanted a runway somewhere in the southern hemisphere for an emergency landing of the space shuttle if it would ever happen. So it's kind of interesting. Perhaps Vinapu was the airport in ancient times for Easter Island. This is a very unusual statue uh, on Easter Island. Uh, Robert Schock also pointed out to he's on his knees. And he's kneeling forward, and his hands are on his knees. And this is what's known as a, the Quizuo posture. This posture is found all over the world. It's found in Egypt. This is in Shang, China. It's your Quizuo posture is, is you're on your knees with your hands on your thighs, and typically your head forward a little bit. Here it is, the Quizuo posture in, in ancient Egypt. Many statues have this posture. It's a kind of a... a Sublima sublimation type of, this is a Shang Chinese statue too in the Kuzuo. It's a sublimation posture, like you're, in, you're on your knees in front of the king or something, and you put your head forward, and the, the, the king is going to either, you know, knight you or cut your head off or something. But it's an, like cranial deformation, like the keystone cuts I was talking about yesterday, uh, it's an unusual posture and one that has a lot of meaning. And it's found all over the world. These are the statues at Tiwanaku with their turbans on. And these statues are too. They're in the Quizuo posture. Here's an Olmec head. In, this will be in Mexico. And in fact, he's also got the, the sadhu type hairstyle where his long hair is tied into a bun on the top of his head. So he's, he's an Olmec Mexican uh, Quizuo posture. This is a Quizuo posture again. He, this is a statue found at Harappa in the Indus Valley. So this is coming really from ancient India and Pakistan. Interesting, too, I won't get into it, but the Rongo Rongo writing is very similar to uh, the, the Hawaiian island uh, hand writing. And it's also similar to the Indus Valley writing, which and neither Rongo Rongo or the Indus Valley writing have been uh, deciphered. But it's very much like uh, hand signals and what are called in India mudras. And that is that everything the, that you do with your hands and your, your wrists and your fingers and your arms, it all has meaning. And so it's, a, it's like Navy signals of holding flags up, one arm's up, one's down. Even the way you're holding your, your, your wrist and your fingers, everything has meaning. And so that is really a lot what the Indus Valley writing is about and so is uh, in my mind, the Rongo Rongo writing as well. Although it's fascinating, Robert's whole thing of the, the plasma discharges and stuff, I, I think that's fascinating. Um, Rongo Rongo writing was also written in an unusual way, which is called the as the ox plows writing or boast of feed on pattern. So that the first line is read left to right, but the next line will be read right to left and then left to right. It's an unusual way of writing. Uh, the Hittites wrote that way. Doric Greek was written that way. The Rongo Rongo writing was written that way too. So once again, uh, the, what the statues look like, how how tall they are, and and so big. And then you see the one guy here. He's this is the Quizuo posture. And notice how too he apparently has kind of a small, like a fake Egyptian beard or something. Also in the Pacific is the fantastic place. It's the eighth wonder of the world. Uh, Graham Hancock showed some photographs of it yesterday. It's called Nan Madal. It's on a remote island off of New Guinea. It's today's the, the um, capital of the of Federated States of Micronesia. It's, it's actually almost practically a territory of the United States. This place is, is the most amazing place in the world. It has got over 250 million tons of basalt stacked up in 100 artificial islands. Much of it's underwater. There's huge walls 30 feet high. 
Uh, much of it is in the water, and, and it's built not really on the island, but onto a coral reef. There's a lot of it's underwater. There is so much material in this city, 250 million tons of basalt, that entire mountains would have been dismantled to get the material to build this city. The natives on the island claim that all these blocks were magically flown through the air. They were all levitated, brought from across the other side of the island, stacked up into first artificial islands and into walls. Much of it's underwater. This place is, it really can't be explained. And although, you know, mainstream archaeologists are saying, oh yeah, you know, they just got some bamboo rafts, you know, just brought, you know, these stones out. The largest of the stones weighs 80 tons there. So, yeah, and, and it's actually on top of a wall. So not only are they moving literally millions of tons of basalt, but they don't even know where it came from. This is a basalt plug that is on the far western side of the island. The, the city itself is on the southeast side. But this is what these basalt plugs look like. And these, this is columnar prismatic basalt. Uh, that site of uh, Ganung Padang in Indonesia is also built out of these things. Basalt is magnetic. It uh, will hold a magnetic charge. And it's, it's a kind of a stone that can be easily levitated. And, and it's magnetic. You would be able to put a magnetic charge into basalt and, in theory, levitate it. And, and according to the islanders, that's what they say went on there. One of my favorite topics is, is Nikola Tesla. He's the, probably the greatest inventor who ever lived. He's a suppressed person. A lot of people don't know who Tesla was. They know that Otis invented the elevator and Edison and invented the phonograph and stuff, but they don't know who Nikola Tesla was. He's the one who invented really three-phase motors and alternating current that's lighting this hotel today, that lights the whole world. AC power is, is really gotten from rotating magnetic fields. It's not created by, by petroleum or gas or nuclear power or anything like that. It's rotating magnets. That's what's, that's what's making AC power. So, he had many friends. Tesla was a very strange person. He never got married. He had a bunch of phobias. He would literally just envision inventions in the sky, in his head. He was this visionary. Uh, in, in my mind, he was some kind of reincarnated Atlantean engineer, uh, you know, straight out of the uh, Edgar Cayce readings and stuff like that. I mean, he was he was such a genius uh, that you know, it's it's really beyond even really fathoming what he did. Guglielmo Marconi was uh, a student of his. Uh, Marconi is allegedly the inventor of the radio with Tesla, actually. He, too, was a very mysterious guy. He was brilliant. Unlike Tesla, Marconi was a very good businessman. He could, he could run a business. He could control millions of dollars. He became very, very wealthy. He supposedly died in 1937, but there's stories that he faked his own death and supposedly moved to South America and started like a secret city, like a, that James Bond city that's in the jungles in the movie Moonraker, where they're going into space with Roger Moore. If you ever see that movie, that's, that's basically based on this secret city that, that Marconi had, had built there. A lot of this also goes with Einstein and what Einstein called the unified field. The unified field is, according to Einstein, was the, uh, the manifestation, ultimately, of electricity, magnetism, and gravity. And all, gravity and electricity and magnetism all manifested from what he said was the unified field. So just like there would be an equation for electromagnetism, according to Einstein, there would be equations for electrogravity and magnetogravity. And that, that's essentially artificial gravity and, and anti-gravity. So the idea of, of using the unified field and the technology behind it to, to levitate things and stuff like that. The whole developing of, of flying saucers. These are some illustrations real quickly I'm going to show you from a book called uh, Gravitational Manipulation of Domed Craft. Craft. And it's about um, using mercury, as I started to talk about yesterday, putting uh, electrical uh, fields, uh, just electricity, into a uh, 
spinning, say, mercury current, and creating what's called a plasma. And uh, plasmas are neon lights or plasmas, electrified gas, essentially, is a plasma. So he's, this was his old designs of how you would uh, use plasmas to create uh, anti-gravity and, and stuff like that, and, and uh, in a sense, it would be your you know, flying saucer type technology. Tesla also invented uh, death rays and things like that, and there's stories of Marconi doing this. When you have these death rays, one of the things they do is they stop the electrical field in your car or whatever you have uh, because you're interfering with the, uh, the, the car's own electrical system and stuff like that. So one of the things that Tesla was going to do and started to do in the, in the early 1920s was he was going to build these towers. And he actually first came here to Colorado to do these experiments near Colorado Springs because he wanted high altitude, he wanted a dry climate, um, kind of the electricity that's in the, the mountains and the dry climate. So he did his early experiments here in Colorado and then he went back to New York and he patented these towers and he started to build one in Long Island called the Warden Cliff Tower. And what this tower was going to do was going to broadcast electricity to airships, to these anti-gravity airships, uh, very similar to uh, just a radio station or a television station broadcasting uh, you know, TV waves and radio waves that you can pick up with your little crystal radio or whatever like that. But what this would have done, these, these towers would be broadcasting power and you would then just put a lamp on a table and turn it on. You wouldn't have to plug it into the wall or something like that. And in fact, J.P. Morgan was going to was financing this for a while, but once he got this whole idea of what Tesla was doing, you would still need power plants like Niagara Falls. I mean, you've got to have the, the AC power coming, but then you're going to broadcast it. But basically what J.P. Morgan realized, he, he's, that you couldn't meter this and you couldn't get people to pay an electrical bill. And all you, the only way to make money off this, really, was to sell the lamps. And he didn't want to. He, he told Tesla, he said, well, I, I don't want to be selling lamps to people. I want to sell them electricity that they'll pay for every month, you know, with their power bill. And so, ultimately, the whole thing failed. This is, this is Tesla's tower in action. It was, this, it was this big tower, and it was broadcasting power. You can see here, there's airships or drawing power, uh, they're electric, they don't have wings or anything, so this was Tesla's vision for the future. Power being broadcast, uh, anti-gravity ships taking the power and going around, and death rays are all part of it. It was all in the 1920s. None of it came to pass, and ultimately the FBI tore down this tower. And there's talk that, uh, that in Russia they're trying to rebuild this. And it was at this time, too, that Tesla became something of a suppressed inventor. They didn't want people to know much about Tesla. Uh, his inventions were just too futuristic and sci-fi. And ultimately, the early Superman movies, the first Superman cartoon, he battles the mad scientist with his magneto death ray. And it's clearly Tesla. So what they did was they demonized Tesla and turned him into the mad scientist who had to be stopped. And, and Superman did it. Now, a group in, uh, that started actually in Milwaukee, and then they were in Chicago. They ultimately moved to Los Angeles in the 30s, and, and then ultimately to the San Diego area. They were called the Lemurian Fellowship. And they claimed in their literature that in Atlantis, there were these, also these power towers, like what Tesla was, was trying to broadcast. But they were these crystal towers. Uh, and then uh, you'd need a power station there, and that these crystal towers were then broadcasting power through Atlantis and all over the world. Well, and it seems pretty fantastic, and yet these things exist, and they're called obelisks. The whole thing of obelisks is that they are monolithic granite, and, and they should be made out of granite, really crystalline towers, and granite is infused with small quartz crystals. So in a sense, a huge granite obelisk is like a giant crystal tower. Uh, it's been proven that uh, obelisks uh, can be tuned and are tuned. There's the fallen obelisk at, in, in Luxor that people, uh, John Anthony West would do this, go up with a tuning fork and hit it and it will vibrate. 
One of the strange things about obelisks, this is the unfinished obelisk at the Aswan Quarry, uh, early photo from the, you know, uh, like 1900 or something like that. Obelisks typically weigh uh, 300 to 400 to 500 tons. I mean, they're huge. Uh, they're, they have to be one piece of stone. Here's the unfinished obelisk here at, at the Aswan Quarry. You know, you look at the Washington Monument, we, we see it on the news all the time. It, in a sense, it's a, it's a faux obelisk. It it's, certainly looks like an obelisk, but it's not monolithic. It's, you know, it's built out of, out of stones, uh, but it, in, its, in its own way. And actually, there's stairs and stuff. You can go up inside it. What happened at the, the, the unfinished obelisk in Aswan, and, and it's huge. Uh, just the idea of quarrying this thing, uh, lifting it out of the quarry, then moving it, and even standing it up is engineering feat. And as I was starting to point out, archaeologists do not have any good explanation for what obelisks were used for, why the Egyptians and others were making obelisks. They, they don't seem to have any real function, kind of like the stone balls. I mean, they're baffled. There's very few books ever written on obelisks, and yet, you know, they're one of the most amazing things to see when you go to Egypt. And this is my buddy, Christopher Dunn. He's standing inside the trench of the unfinished obelisk. Uh, he maintains, too, that they had, you know, heavy equipment and things like that to, to, to get into the obelisk. They stopped. The reason it's the unfinished obelisk was about three-quarters of the way of quarrying it. They discovered that the rock had a natural crack in it. And as soon as they saw that, they knew they, they couldn't use it. It has to be perfect. There can't not be any cracks. So it, w it wasn't until they almost had completely quarried the obelisk that they said, oh, forget it. Can't use this one. So anyway, here's the, um, the obelisk. or uh, It's not an obelisk. It's a faux obelisk at, uh, in Washington, D.C., the Washington Monument, being hit by lightning. So the whole idea that obelisks are, could have been... Uh, these, these crystal towers that ultimately were somehow broadcasting energy. It, it's even occurred to me that perhaps when Edgar Casey talked about the terrible crystal and it had to do with these airships and, and power in Atlantis, that perhaps it is the obelisk is the terrible crystal. Uh, and the other, for me, the, another uh, explanation of the terrible crystal was the Great Pyramid as a, as a power plant. Uh, Tib has, I think, a different explanation for that. Obelisks aren't just in Egypt, and in fact, uh, obelisks are also, they apparently were all around the world. Uh, they, they are known to be in Ethiopia, and these are some of the obelisks that are today in Aksum in Ethiopia. Uh, I was just there in, in November, and it was, it was a great trip. I wanted to go there to see the obelisks, and, and in fact, I took um, Graham Hancock's book, The Sign and the Seal, with me, and I read it there, and it was great reading while I was in, e in Ethiopia. The largest obelisk that we ever known, that's ever known really, is the obelisk, at, which is called the, the Great Stell, or Great Obelisk at Aksum, and it fell. And it's larger than any obelisk in Egypt. And this is it, right here. And uh, it, it fell down and, and uh, fell, smashed itself into a dozen pieces. It weighed approximately 520 tons. So it's almost getting up there with the, uh, the giant stones at Baalbek, which weigh like a thousand tons or something. And in fact, yeah, here, here are pieces of the giant obelisk, the great obelisk there. And this structure here, that it's, it struck this big uh, kind of a tomb type building, they call it a tomb. And Ethiopians today believe that underneath these rocks, and there's they're huge slabs, and then the obelisk itself is crashed down on top of it, they believe that there's a magic machine under there that levitates the stones and, and was what was used to raise the obelisks and things like that. And, even, and then the Ark of the Covenant, which they also believe, Ethiopians believe is in Ethiopia, they also think it was used to, to raise these obelisks. I mean, and this is from the Lonely Planet guidebook for Ethiopia. I was so surprised to read this. It was like, oh yeah, Ethiopians believe there's this you know, ancient machine under there that levitates the stones and stuff. And I was like, really? Okay. That's the kind of, that's the kind of stuff I want to hear about. Also there in Aksum are keystone cuts, just like we saw yesterday. So once again, these same people are going all over the world. They're 
cutting giant megaliths, they're raising obelisks, they're, they're got keystone cuts, they're pouring the metal clamps into it. So, and here's one of the keystone cuts with the metal inside it. Normally, uh, when they make these, in all the constructions, where these keystone cuts are and the clamps, there's always other stones on top of it. They're in, in a finished building, they're never exposed. You only can see them as you tear down the walls and stuff like that. Also in Oxum are also these monolithic doors, just like at Tiwanaku uh, and at Persepolis and at probably other places around the world too. They believe that they have the Ark of the Covenant there in Oxum. It's supposedly in this church right here, the church of uh, Our Lady uh, Miriam. So, and there's a guy in there who supposedly guards it. This is him right over here. He, they choose an old, the old one priest is, is, is to guard the Ark of the Covenant, and he never leaves that building until he, he dies. Just outside of Aksum, a little bit uh, to the west, is the quarry. It's up on this mountain up here. Uh, I always, when I can, want to go to the quarries where they're quarrying these giant stones and stuff like that. And so, yeah, they had to move this giant obelisk, 520 uh, tons, and then move it from this quarry. And there's still some giant stones there that are partially quarried, like in, in Egypt. Also in Ethiopia are these rock-cut churches of La Labella. They're pretty amazing, too. They're monolithic. They're cut out of solid rock, uh, like this one. There's, there's a dozen of these churches there. They're really quite something to see. They're very similar to the rock-cut places in India, like Alora and Ajanta. The legends in Ethiopia are that the stonemasons would work during the day, and then angels would come at night and, and really do all the work for them. So yeah, allegedly, angels did this. Uh, and once again, I mean, to do all this and all the material they were using, it was pretty amazing. And they, as far as I'm concerned, they're using power tools. Uh, like in uh, Cusco and other places, are cutting tunnels through solid rock. Pretty amazing there. I, I, I thought Ethiopia was really a pretty interesting place. There are actually even obelisks in England. There's a place in Yorkshire called the Devil's Arrows. And the Devil's Arrows were uh, four obelisks. It's right near York. Um, this is also kind of near Sherwood Forest and where Robin Hood supposedly went around. And it's not much of a tourist site. I mean, some tourists go there. And they, they were apparently obelisks, and they're, but they're, people have gone up and kind of carved the top, so there's only about a third of them left, and there's all these grooves and stuff like that. And then, uh, so here's some photos. The Devil's Arrows, is they're called, is kind of what they look like. And these grooves were put in them. It was like people kept, you know, uh, cutting them and, and even trying to cut the tops off and whatnot. Then there's a town in, near Scarborough in Yorkshire, right on the, the east coast of, of York in, in England, and it's called Rudston. And at Rudston is also the remains of an obelisk. Uh, it's called the Rudston Monolith. Here's what it looks like today. Uh, it's also very weathered. They've put like a little tin cap on it. And it's then, and in fact, they built this church because of the obelisk uh, was standing there. And it's just standing there by itself. There's just the one. Just other pictures of the Redstone monolith. So here we go. So I was fascinated. Supposedly there were there's also monoliths in, in Karnak, uh, kind of obelisk type mo monoliths that they've fallen. Karnak in France, more pictures of the Redstone uh, obelisk. And then get this, uh, back in the 70s when Charles Berlitz wrote his popular book, The Bermuda Triangle, and that book sold millions of copies like Eric von Donneken's Cherries to the Gods. And one of the, uh, so that book spawned dozens of sort of imitation books on the Bermuda Triangle. And people started to get into the Great Lakes. Well, there's, oh, you know, there's a Bermuda Triangle in the Great Lakes. And one of those books was written by this Canadian guy. His name is Hugh Cochran. It's called Gateway to Oblivia. This book came out in, in 1980. It was mass market paperback. It's kind of a rare book today. And what he said in one chapter of this book was that in northern Ontario, in this area, what's called uh, Presqu'ile Province Park. It's an area of just to the east of Toronto. Over here is this park. And what was in this park originally, uh, in, but in the lake, 
this is in the early 1800s, there supposedly was an obelisk came up out of Lake Ontario, and, and it was about 50 feet or 100 feet or, or something off the shore, and the very tip of the obelisk actually came out of the lake. And according to him, uh, in the early 1800s, if people who lived around there, they would, on a nice summer day, they would row out to this obelisk. They would uh, anchor their rowboats to the tip of it. It was coming up hundreds of feet from the bottom of the lake. And they would have a picnic. And then they would go back. And then, but what happened was, there was, and it has to do with an Indian, Indian chief, and he made a big curse. And uh, then there was a huge storm on the lake, and it was, it was like 1804. And there was a ship there, too, that was trying to come back to the port right nearby here. And the, the people on the shore lit all these bonfires so that the ship would, would kind of could find its way to shore. And it was this terrible, terrible storm. And, but the ship, and they could see it from the shore, the ship didn't come to their bonfires on the shore. And it was like drawn to this obelisk. And then apparently it hit the obelisk, and in the storm, when it was all over, the ship sank, everyone was, was lost, and the obelisk was gone. And it, had, it apparently fell over, perhaps the ship hitting it, and it's now, in theory, lying on the bottom of Lake Ontario. So I thought that was a fascinating story. So now, let's go to the moon, and you know what? On the moon, there are obelisks. And they're called the Blair Cuspids. And they're named after a British astronomer. His name was Blair. So they're called the Blair Cuspids. Uh, this, is, this is a Russian diagram. The, the Russians and all their space, space program were very interested in, in anomalies on the moon. So this is supposedly what the Blair Cuspids look like. And we, we can kind of get it from shadows that are on the moon. Uh, big standing stones and obelisks are going to cast these shadows. So yeah. Uh, obelisk on the moon, yeah, um, and we'll we'll see some more about that. There are stories that the moon is hollow, and that there are bottomless craters, supposedly on the Apollo missions, and they dropped the command modules onto the moon. The moon rang like a bell, they said. This crater here uh, is allegedly this bottomless crater. They cannot find a, a bottom to it, uh, and it's. Um, this is, this is in my book on extraterrestrial archaeology and stuff. So perhaps this is actually entrance into the hollow moon. And if you can get inside there, you can get to that space bar with the green fizzy drinks. <laughs> so <laughs> this also the Russians, the, you know, while we were doing our own space program in the, in the 60s, the Russians were sending uh, their own moon probes. They, they were called the Zond, Zond probes. And uh, one of the Zon probes took this photo of what appears to be this 20-mile high tower on, on the moon. And so this, too, it would be, in, in theory, uh, maybe an obelisk, some giant, you know, super tower that's, that's on the moon. Uh, Mike Barra, in, in his book on ancient aliens on, on Mars 2, uh, he, he maintains that this is also, uh, this is a Zon 3 photo. They're from 1965. And that it's showing actually the remains of one of these giant domes that are on the moon. So, uh, yeah, Mike is, uh, you know, he, we're his publisher, and I'm, I'm the editor of his books. He's, he's now written four books. He's come out with a book about every year. And so this is, Mike maintains that, yeah, there are these domes on the moon, or partial domes. And there's these parts of pieces of glass and stuff. This is what they would have looked like. Uh, he's maintaining that here in the, this Proclus, uh, the crater Proclus, that this glowing spot, that this is a, a crater or a dome on the moon that is reflecting light. He even maintains that on some of the Apollo missions that they, they knew, the Apollo knew about these domes, and there would be huge sort of like glass walls, but only fragments are there because they've been destroyed in some interplanetary war or something like that. And so, yeah, he's maintaining that that some, some of the Apollo photos, too, these, the astronauts are standing there next to these giant walls of glass. I mean, that's, that's pretty fascinating. The whole idea, too, uh, that some of the NASA photos from Apollo, that allegedly, you know, NASA's going to sort of Photoshop, you know, some of these photos or just not release them. But they do occasionally just accidentally release photos. So he's saying, too, that they're actually what are ziggurats 
on the moon. And it is, there are these structures. There's uh, something similar to uh, like a Sumerian type ziggurat. Uh, so this is a, it's in the Daedalus crater. This is the frame number from Apollo 11. This is a photo too that he was claiming is uh, like a saucer, sort of in a hangar in a, one of the craters. This is a photo too, uh, supposedly showing what seems to be like a crash ship or something like that on the moon. Here's a close up of it. Whoops. Um, the idea too that there are certain pyramid objects and things like that on the moon. Back in the early 70s, uh, when all these Eric von Donica and Bermuda Triangle books were being written, there were a couple of books about the moon. One was called Somebody Else is on the Moon. Another one was called Our Mysterious Spaceship Moon. And they both maintained that, yeah, there were pyramids uh, on the moon, other kind of structures, um, the obelisks, like the Blair Cuspids. This thing looks like some kind of Tesla kind of tower thing on, that's also on the moon, something like a... Um, uh, like a giant Tesla tower or something like that. All right, let's now move on to the uh, to Mars. So we'll see some unusual things there. What you have on Mars too? That Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos, and they actually they're they're very small moons, and they rotate in opposite directions around uh, planet Mars. And uh, everybody's been very curious about these moons. They there's talk that they might be artificial, also that they might be hollow. Phobos, both Phobos and Deimos have these unusual striations on the, them. Uh, they can't really figure out what, what those striations are all about. And well, there, was the, what, there was two orbiters that went up. One was the Mars Express, and the other was the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. And it took, really, what were photos of what seemed to be obelisks, uh, monoliths, on, on Mars. And here's a photo of it getting close. And I mean, one way that we can tell these things is, is by the shadows that are, that are cast. So that they're, they're tall, they're narrow, uh, that, I mean, it's, it's something, you know, very uh, unusual, it would seem. And perhaps if the whole idea that there are obelisks on our planet, obelisks on the moon, and, and apparently obelisks uh, on the moons of Mars. Another unusual thing that happened with Phobos was uh, around uh, 19, 1990 or so, 1988, the Russians sent up a probe, and uh, uh, it was 1989, and it was called the Phobos II probe. They sent up two, Phobos I and Phobos II, and they named them after the moons of Mars. And just as it was approaching Phobos, it took this photo, and this photo is, is Phobos, and what is apparently some kind of missile or elongated craft coming, coming either out, either from Mars or coming from the moon. And then what it did was, here it is from the side, so we can kind of see like what it might, you know, some kind of craft either leaving or possibly a missile. The, the probe then switched to Mars and took this last photo, also of either some craft or a missile, and then the probe went out. And it was like shot out of space, or some Tesla type beam weapon just took it out and, and it stopped transmitting back to the United States. The Russians kept this secret for years. And the Russian space program has always been uh, quite secretive. And some would say the American space program is, is quite secretive too. So this is, this is Deimos, the other moon of Mars, and, and what it looks like. So. Uh, Mike Barra also, uh, you know, he's, he's a friend and I'm his editor. And so he's, part of his thing is that Mars has got all kinds of mechanical parts and pieces of machinery and stuff like that lying around. And I mean, some of the things are simulacras. It's, there was a picture of Bigfoot on Mars, which you know, it's kind of like a rock, you know. But some of the rocks are pretty interesting. And some of them look like they're shaped megaliths. Others look even like petrified wood and stuff like that. There are pyramids on Mars. This is the uh, what's called the DNM pyramid or the Dupuytre and Molinar pyramid, and the face on Mars is kind of nearby. And in fact, with the Mars Pathfinder on the Moon, that it's taking a picture of what seems to be a pyramid and almost what seems like a sphinx there in front of it. 
So this is, in, in a sense, the Sphinx and the pyramid on Mars. Uh, here we are, clouds on Mars, geysers and things like that. The Mars may well, uh, you know, really be a place with underground tunnels, underground bases. Uh, there's dust devils and things like that on Mars. We've got interesting sand dunes on Mars that have been, uh, you know, shaped by the winds and stuff of Mars. Uh, even what look like structures on Mars that are being buried in the sand and things like that. Uh, other oddball, just fossils and rocks on the on Mars. They they call this one the the stoplight, or the or the traffic light. So, uh, and, and these are real these are real photos coming from Pathfinder on Mars. And you know people on the internet and uh, many of them are in in England actually and. They just go over very carefully all of these uh, Mars images, looking for something artificial, something that's interesting to see. This one they call the, the coffin on Mars, some kind of megalithic tomb. And so one of the interesting things about our solar system and, and, and Mars has to do with this, in a sense, is that our Astronomers have often theorized that our solar system, you know, has these planets, and there's there's a thing called Bode's law. He was a astro German astronomer in the mid 1800s, and he created a logar logarithmic equation that went out from the sun. And basically, what Bode's law said was that as you go out from the sun, there should be a planet here, and then you go a little bit farther out from the sun, there should be another planet here, and then as you go more farther from the sun, there's another planet here, and our solar system fit his law very well, except for one thing. Between Mars and Jupiter, he said, there should be a planet. But there's not a planet between Mars and Jupiter. What is there instead is the asteroid belt. And so the idea here is that a number of people have proposed is that there was a planet between Mars and Jupiter, but that planet exploded and it blew up. And instead of there now being a planet between Mars and Jupiter, there's the asteroid belt. And when that planet blew up, it showered the solar system with asteroids. And those asteroids would have hit Mars, they would have hit other planets, they would have hit our moon, they would have hit Earth too. And in fact, that is you know the basic story of Superman, and that he's from this exploded planet. His father, Jor-El, talks to him through these crystal uh, devices. He's, he's dead, in fact. So, uh, a couple other last few things. I'm going to wind up here quickly, and then perhaps we'll have time just for a couple of questions. But as NASA goes farther out into space, they find some unusual thing. There's bright spots on on the on Ceres, one of the moons um, uh, of Saturn. I mean, they can't explain this. So, again, it seems like many of the moons in our solar system are hollow, and including. Uh, this one, and perhaps there's something going on I inside. So one of the uh, one of the moons here too uh, of Saturn is called Iapetus. So here it is. We'll look at it real quickly. And I know um, you know Richard Hoagland with with Mark Barra. They are some of the ones who who've also early on noticed this. But this moon is really unusual. It, it seems to be a kind of manufactured moon. And it has what seems to be like a ridge going across it. There you can really kind of see it. So it's like uh, almost like it's been artificially created, like a ball. And you can see the seam. So here's like this ridge. I mean, this is, and once again, you know, NASA and it, uh, astronomers, they, they have trouble commenting on this. I mean, and it's same in archaeology. When you're baffled by something and you just don't have a good explanation, the best thing to do is just not talk about it. <laughs> and you know, if you, sometimes if you ignore things long enough, they they'll just go away. So that's it. And here's another picture of that moon. So the whole idea that uh, our solar system, uh, and and for me, this is. You know, this is in some ways the best evidence for extraterrestrials is is structures that are, that are off our planet. 
And so, I mean, either extraterrestrials are coming here and, and making this stuff and doing it, and, it, and there's something going on there like that, or else ancient humans, uh, Atlanteans, we, you know, we eventually took off into space 100,000 years ago, and we did all this stuff. It wouldn't seem that that's necessarily the case, maybe a combination of the two. So I wanted to give a short explanation uh, presentation today because I know we're running over, and that this that is the end. So thanks very much. And of course, you have David's website, and uh, you can watch David on the Ancient Alien series. Again, another round of applause for David Hatcher Childress.